My name is Luca Faccio. I'm a photographer and live in Vienna. I've been able to travel to North Korea seven times since 2005, getting a picture of the country's people and their worldview. During these trips, I saw more than I was allowed to be shown. Any journalist visiting the country is accompanied by minders around the clock. I've known mine for a few years now. Here, I'm taking pictures with them. They check what you film, who you talk to, and what about. I see the familiar images, but time and again I see new ones. I notice that there are a few new ideas for many of the people caught in this collective mindset. A paranoid system, one that I too have to submit to. It is a requirement on every visit to start by going to the statues of the two great leaders. I'm familiar with this. They're part of the large Mansur Day monument, which commemorates North Korea's fight against the Japanese occupation. The capital, Pyongyang, is home to more than three million people and to a middle class that's becoming economically increasingly independent of the state, a middle class that could in the long term become a problem for the regime. Around two million mobile phones have been approved since 2008. I'm currently being monitored with one, they're used for phone calls too, but only domestic ones and for selected citizens, such as my minder. It's the first time I've been allowed to travel by taxi, of course, only with my minder. We're going to a supermarket in which I even discover typically Western products. In my opinion, the people are strikingly well-dressed. There are casinos and I even spot some Viennese coffee culture here. Of course, I'm the only guest. Much to my surprise, the state television shows Western propaganda figures. During my visit, the controversial Slovenian rock group Leibach was the first Western band to be allowed to perform. The dreams of reunification between North and South still exist here, but they regularly melt away as a result of new provocations and everyday aggressive posturing at what's been called the world's most dangerous border. I've tried to find out what the North Koreans are really like, because for me, there are perfectly normal people behind the system. Appearances are deceptive. I'm not in a conventional souvenir shop. I'm in Panmunjong in the demilitarized zone. There's no shortage of coffee, smiles, and cartridges. Coffee, please. Coffee. This is the highway from Pyongyang to Seoul. This is the railway line that has been interrupted for more than 50 years now. Here we have manuscripts by Kim Il-sung. Great leader Kim Jong-il visited this place four times. I drive through the demilitarized zone with my minders, three in total. The atmosphere is unpleasant, full of tension and surreal. On the day before my visit, shots were fired. Today, military exercises are taking place. It smells of gunpowder and war. My minder tells me his army will protect me. That's no comfort. The zone stretches across the entire peninsula along the 38th parallel. This is where the Allies arbitrarily divided the country after the Second World War. The border zone is 248 kilometers long and four kilometers wide. It's considered the most dangerous border in the world. I meet a colonel here. I've known him for 10 years. So well, in fact, that we often drink schnapps together after our meeting. It's clear to me that there's the person in the uniform and the person underneath it. This is where the truce and the end of the war were negotiated. <laughs> For you, taking pictures is the most important thing. You don't need an explanation. The colonel takes me from one barracks to the next. It's always important to mention how often which leader has been to the site. He has to tell me that.
but he's clearly also interested in other things. How does Austria report on the current situation on the Korean Peninsula? This is the most significant August location with regard to the armistice. Two days after this building was completed, on the 27th of July 1953, the armistice was agreed and signed here. On the day it was signed, the Americans wanted to move the building northwards. They didn't manage because journalists saw it and prevented it. On the 3rd of March 2012, the Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un said during a visit, if there is another war with the Americans, we won't sign a truce. We'll destroy the Americans until they capitulate. Evil Americans who move buildings. Sounds like a fairy tale to me. The casual way in which war gets discussed here sounds to me like Italians talking about football. My trip continues. We're on our way to the notorious blue buildings in which the meetings between the delegates from North and South Korea take place. It's the exact border between the two countries, drawn by the victorious allies of the Second World War. I have to say you made a real effort with the photographs. Here they are, the Blue Huts, the start of the drama for the Korean people, in the middle of an impenetrable border. The Berlin Wall was a garden fence by comparison, it said. A few meters from here is South Korea. Anyone wanting to get across is shot. I've heard there are some foreigners who are nice to us here but who make money with us when they get home. I later learned that the interpreter gave me a different translation, maybe to save face or maybe on purpose, I don't know. Critical questions are dangerous here. There are 13 newspapers in North Korea, but only one opinion. Back in Pyongyang, I want to find out what people think about the two Koreas reuniting. I'm allowed to talk about this with a young student. I want to tell them uh, about our reunification. So all the Korean people have to uh, try for the reunification of our country. The next obligatory item on the agenda is a visit to Kim Il-sung's birthplace. He's the founder of the state and the house where he was born is a veritable site of pilgrimage that everyone has to visit. father, mother, whole family members were fighting against the Japanese. So in these surroundings, President Kim Il-sung was born. From early times, received patriotic and revolutionary education from his parents. So our the great, uh, great comrade Kim Jong-un, not only young women, not only young people, it is all, all Korean people very loved him, very loved him. So that because he very like our the President Kim Il-sung, he very like our the General Kim Jong-un. Everyone loves the great leader. But is that true? It becomes impossible to determine what's real and what's staged here. 